Today we welcome back Sarah Bradley, CEO of De Montfort University Student Union. Sarah is passionate about innovation in student engagement and experience, education, policy, well-being, positive mental health strategies and communications. But it would be great to hear an introduction to yourself in your own words, Sarah. Yes, I'm Sarah Bradley, she, her. I am the chief exec of um, De Montfort University Student Union. I'm also trustee for uh, SULETS, which is a student lettings charity, um, and previously a, a school governor for uh, my son's school. Um, my passions, some of my passions include <laughs> um, organisational behaviours, um, especially how kind of people intersect, how we build really good cultures and how organisational behaviour kind of stretches out throughout the vastness of our society. Fantastic. Um, so 489 of our 500 respondents have experienced microaggressions in group work at university. So I wonder, how are you seeing this play out in universities and why do you think microaggressions against women are so normalised? It's such an interesting question and doesn't surprise me at all that that many people mm. responded that way to that survey. Um, if we're talking about gendered microaggressions, the normalization of that is it, it's such it's such it permeated into our society. Mm. There is a natural hierarchy of men versus women, especially in westernized culture. Um, it's a really, really um, sort of expansive and vast question. And I think it's really important that I kind of um, sort of say as well, there are marginalized um, people out there that I do not represent that definitely um, need their voices heard more in, on this subject. Um, the angle that I will take from this is kind of the organizational behavior side, why we think these behaviors happen and how we might mm. be able to combat it if we start looking at things ever so slightly differently. The way I see this play out in universities, um, and, and, it's been, and it's prevalent in almost every university, is the gap between two ones and firsts um, mm -hmm. gendered. So at a very, very kind of basic level, when universities take into account their student data, they do it by male, female, prefer not to say, at a very, very basic level. And the gap between males um, attaining firsts and females uh, identifying students attaining firsts has been a problem throughout since since records began is it attaining or awarding um it's, it's called an attainment gap really yeah so um but yeah that's a really really good question because that will that would speak to the bias right mm. it's like who 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 are we awarding yeah that's actually potentially a really good way universities to look at it and look at their own bias mm. um so you see it kind of play out in that way. Um, and also really interestingly as well, quite a lot of the universities that, that we think of, say De Montfort, for example, they're primarily um, female identifying student population. So uh, let's say they're about 60% female identifying student population. Yeah. And if the attainment gap is still skewed towards men, then we can kind of see how that's playing out at a really kind of granular level at university. Um, I'm not entirely sure too much about kind of further education, but I, I would probably say that that's also a sort of a theme that has taken taken us through our education system since mm. primary to, to secondary all the way through to university. Well, there's lots of research about it playing out in, in sort of school um, playgrounds as well. So yep. I'm sure it is similar the whole way through. Um, so 80 8.5% of our survey respondents reported being spoke over, uh, spoken over at school and nearly 50% reported these types of behaviours at home as well. Are you shocked, angry, confused by these stats or is this what you might have expected? It's, um, when we apply kind of feelings to this, I think I'm probably, I probably speak for a vast majority of yeah. women here where I am not surprised. Neither am I angry. I am. I have been raised this way. It's mm. it's sort of it's it's systemic, right? Mm. This is a systemic bias that's kind of driven towards men. That's why we talk about the patriarchy. So um, it's it's brilliant though that there's kind of a level of honesty here coming through from this survey. Yeah, it's really encouraging that students are starting to view the the way that they were at home versus the way they are now in an educational professional setting as things that now intersect. And when you are at home, whether for good or bad, you're sheltered, right? You kind of have this idea of how you're brought up. 
-hmm. And it's only when you go to higher education and have these really expansive experiences that you start to question, oh, okay, right, I'm spoken over in seminars. Hang on a minute. I was also spoken over at the dinner table or I was spoken over at that kind of family event and it's normalised, right? So, yeah, it's really encouraging that people are starting to sort of answer these surveys like that. Yeah, I we, of course, also host the interview series. And I remember a few months ago speaking to the uh, EDI leader at a university. I can't remember which one. And I asked her what had inspired her to go on for a career. And she was really sort of at the top of her career. Um, But what had inspired this and she as part of her answer, sort of remembered and reflected on finding it so irritating that she had a brother and she was always the one that was asked to lay the table and that had sort of inspired her to go on and create change. Um, And and so it it sort of reflects what you're saying. It's inspiring that light is being put on these things to to change and develop. Um, Moving on, in response to the question, do you feel like you can speak up on these matters at university? Only 22% replied yes, and 38% reported that they didn't feel like anyone would care if they did speak up. What's stopping students from speaking out, and what do you think university leaders can do to show that their students will be heard? This is such an interesting question and sort of permeates lots of different harassments and lots of different kind of microaggressions. Like, why don't people say anything? Um, And we spoke about this in our last conversation. It's um, especially uh, geared towards things like sexual harassment. How can people speak up if they don't know that it's happening? And this kind of intersects with um, what I was saying about sort of being expansive and kind of opening our minds a little bit more to what might actually be happening. Um, There is... It would be really simple for me to kind of say things like, well, um, we should run a, run a call out campaign. We should run this. We should run that. But that's that is always geared to the people who, who have had the space and chance to um, evaluate their lives to date. Um, and there's a certain privilege that comes with that. There's a certain kind of element of. I have been gifted time and space to do my inner work and inner child work and I've gone to therapy and I've done meditation and I've done all of this. And, and that sort of is, is saved for a certain subsect of our um, society still. Whereas for the students who still face the pressures of, of home, they still go home every single holiday and they are still spoken over um, and they still are geared towards more gendered roles within the home, like you've just spoken about kind of mm. laying the table. Mm. When you go back for um, Christmas family dinners, that's still going to happen, right? So um, so not only are you kind of attempting to sort of do this narrative shift of yourself, then kind of taking on the societal narrat- narrative shift is huge. It's massive. Really interestingly from um, student unions, um, in, the, in the last four years, we've seen a sort of a drop off in students going for more gendered roles, as in women's officer or sort of running for those kind of roles. So less people applying for less those applying. overall because it's a gendered role or why? Poss- possibly because um, there is this kind of, but what will happen? What will change? Mm. And I remember and there was this... Sad. It is sad. And there was this big campaign sort of recently about... Um, obviously inspired by Sarah Everard, about changing misogyny into a hate crime, Mm. to add legitimacy to the discrimination that that female-identifying people are facing, that it had to be written into law that harassment at this level is that damaging for it to be taken seriously. And I can see how that would permeate at a more local level in universities. Mm. And taking on this kind of outspoken role... um, it sort of carries with it this sort of weight, doesn't it? And it's like even now, if you identify yourself as a feminist, there is a sort of, uh, oh, 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 mm, and this kind of <laughs> idea of what that means mm. that's, that's kind of an unconscious bias in our minds. And we've already got kind of the unconscious bias of what a woman means, kind of based on culture and things like that. And then we add on to that what a feminist is. And, and the two don't mix. I remember when I was at university, there was sort of um, an issue with a nightclub that had um, done some not 100% above board okay uh, marketing. And it was actually really distasteful. 
and the, the university femme socks started picketing outside the, the club and the club sort of you know, eventually had to close down and people are really sad because well, our favourite club night has mm. gone. Even though it was very clear in the marketing material that had been put up, it was completely unacceptable. And I remember defending uh, femme sock and saying... Well, it was abhorrent what was in. It, they, there were rape jokes, and mm. that's not okay to be promoting a club with that. And I remember people saying, oh, no, you're not one of those feminists, are you? And I was like, what? <laughs> Obviously, I'm a woman at university. <laughs> yeah. What? It makes me sad to hear that that is still the case in the university environment. That It's still the case in society. Everywhere. University reflects society. I mean, mm. we've... We've seen it kind of in how students are viewed through the cost of living crisis. We've kind of seen it. We've everything that happens in our society. The government has a huge amount of sway and influence in kind of university life. Um, so yeah, anything that's kind of happening more wide, will, more widely, will happen there. It's the same with like classism. Classism is rife in UK universities. Mm. Huge. Um, you know that, and that's why Russell Group exists, which are essentially elitist institutions quote me on that <laughs> but <laughs> but that but that is where it comes from it's kind of this idea of um if you have the money you can go to university and get a um, above par um education if you don't you can get a subpar one anywhere you wish oh, yeah. and and all of these societal ideas permeate our, our education system yeah oh mm. <laughs> um so many people wouldn't like to think of themselves as committing harm to others um, and may even find it difficult to acknowledge that they play a part in spreading misogyny. Why do you think the concept of microaggressions and EDI more generally has been such a divisive topic in, in the current climate? This is where I start really getting into the realms of kind of organizational or group or group mm. behavioral psychology. And this is where it's really, really, really interesting because of course nobody wants to be seen as something that's outside of the realm of good or moral. Mm. But at the same time, we kind of, it, the, there's a safety in groupthink. Um, and kind of what we've seen here, especially when it comes to things like microaggressions um, and how we sort of view them as a society, is there is now sort of almost two camps, right? There is a, a camp which sort of says, yes, microaggressions exist and uh, I am learning. And then there is a camp that, say, that says microaggressions don't exist and I'm learning. But, they, but it, how they learn and who they learn from, this is all groupthink. And this mm. is where critical thinking is essential for societal progression. Because what it does is it takes the individual out of the group, provides them space and time to come up with better and more interesting conclusions. And I say interesting because to think the same is really, really boring. Mm. Um, and also, like, society has, has moved, like we've, we've seen in history, society has moved off the back of an individual's brilliance mm. that has kind of taken it back to the group. We've, we've seen this. So this is where it's, when we relate it to um, gendered microaggressions, what we're dealing with are two kind of, well, probably more, but two very distinct camps that kind of say there is no such thing as gendered microaggressions. It's just the way things are. And there is this one group that says, no, let's think differently. But both groups are falling down the, the rabbit hole of groupthink. Mm. And this is where there does need to be critical thinking, critical analysis. And this is where organisational behaviour can really help us. Um, and in an educational setting, that's where you start to build up the frameworks to allow that to happen. Mm. So it's you sort of see it as this holistic, this systemic this um, this massive conversation instead of two sides. And how do you get people, how do you actually practically get people to break out with those thoughts and, and push us all on? I've said this before, but higher education in particular, um, we it's a meeting of the best minds that mm. we can possibly get from all corners of the world. And they research and they come up with these incredible sort of uh, progressive, in, amazing ideas. And then we train students on how to not drop litter and it's a PowerPoint presentation. Yeah. 
And it's, and I've kind of said this before, it's, it's this idea of, right, when a student comes to university or when a student goes to school, yeah. Like, what are we what are we teaching them? Why, why are they here? And the whole reason that we educate um, our children and the whole reason that we educate ourselves as adults is to be better, right? It's to be better than we were before, yeah. you know, sort of fill our brains with whatever and kind of really, really engage in that sort of wonderful education setting that everybody loves about higher education mm. um, and everybody fiercely defends. And I kind of get it. I kind of get it. You know, it's just like, ah, oh, look, the world is open. I can read a book and I can, and I can, and I can critique it. And look, look, look at my brain. My it's, brain's expanding. It's expanding. Look at it. And it's sort of, and it's wonderful. That's why people stay in academia their entire lives, because it's so expansive and kind of addictive, right? For sure. Brilliant. But, we're, but we take students and they come to university and one of them does a law degree and then one of them does a philosophy degree and one of them does mathematics. I mean, incredible, but no way. <laughs> and then we say... Okay, and then I'm also going to train you on how to not sexually harass people with this PowerPoint presentation, um, which has nothing to do with your law degree, which has nothing to do with your wider kind of um, engagement within your higher education setting, has nothing to do with your friends, has nothing to do with your partners. Mm. And we sort of put these (laughs) add-ons, and it's just like, right... And this is feminism, and this is how to not be sexist, and this is how to be a decent human within this tiny context. Whereas if we kind of, this is me just casting huge aspersions here, but if we saw education as this holistic whole, if we started started sort of favouring critical thinking and critical analysis over groupthink, that's how you start changing the cogs of society. And obviously education is just one part of that. It's quite a challenge, given yeah, yeah, everything. Um, so, what part does training pay in all of this? Which we just touched on training. <laughs> Our research highlighted that sixty-four percent of students said there should be better ways to report issues in university spaces, and there was also an overwhelming bias to increasing the provision of preventative training for staff and students alike. What? is your view on this and what have you seen working well in the educational setting so my view on this is training turn training on its head like when was the last training course well you don't have to say but the last (laughs) training course you went on that was decent that was good aside from good courses training obviously um hard to remember yeah very hard it's it's quite difficult you know like i just went on one on um uh, manual handling um, of, a box. Oh, okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure what you were Manual. handling. <laughs> of boxes. Knowing me, it could, be, <laughs> could anything. be anything. Could be anything. But it was manual handling of boxes. Okay, brilliant. And uh, now I am trained on how to manually handle mm. a box and how not to throw my back out or hurt other people in the process. Brilliant. But what did I actually learn? <laughs> Like, do I care about about it? What did you learn? Bend your knees? Bend your knees. But like, and that's it. Brilliant. But did I really care about my own self-preservation in that? Did I really kind of come away thinking, oh, I actually understand now that me picking up boxes better is better for my team because, you know, I'm setting a... Yeah, exactly. And, And I was able to have some sort of rapport with the trainer and it became this more sort of, yeah, like more holistic understanding of things. We talk about preventative training, and that is such a add-on fix to a permeated societal problem. Mm. But of course, there needs to be a, a redressing of the balance. Of course, there needs to be something. And it's so easy for us to say, but this shouldn't be happening, though. Mm. But it is. That's the problem. Yeah. So... so. So when students come to university, and I can only really speak in a university con- yeah. uh, context, I think it's, I think you've, if you start with the bare bones of training, and I love training. Hey, good, co- good course, plug. <laughs> but I love training. Um, I, but it's, it's starting with the bare bones basics of what training is. What are we trying to achieve within the realms of, of, of we have? Because we're not going to change society today, are we? We're not going to change, like, we're not going to smash the patriarchy yeah. in this one course, are Unfortunately. we? Unfortunately. Unfortunately. How wonderful would that be? (laughs) But we're not going to smash the patriarchy in one course. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of make it accessible for the people who want to learn. 
Um, and uh, and this idea of kind of preventative training automatically gets people to tense up because you've got those two camps, which is microaggressions don't exist, tense. Yeah. Microaggressions do exist, tense, and everybody tenses up. Mm. And you kind of you start at this sort of opposing view standpoint. And it's really interesting with preventative training in particular, lots of people say, but it's good to be uncomfortable. And that's great. But um, there's this brilliant um, behavioral uh, psychological term called effect heuristic, which is essentially emotion driven decision making. And it's I mean, I needn't tell you how look at the government emo- <laughs> <laughs> emotional decision emotion driven decision making mini deci- budget it's here it's just everywhere it permeates absolutely anything because we're human beings we're emotional creatures but but it, effectively what it means is right i've had an, an emotional response i am now yeah. going to change a policy based on that emotional response no more of that please no well, <laughs> it's the human condition <laughs> But um, effect heuristic is, and again, if we kind of apply it to this sort of organizational psychology, is, um, is essentially why training happens, right? There's an emotional response, mm-hmm. and then we take all of the, emotional, uh, all the, uh, the emotion out of it, and we make it as bland and as, uh, and as rigid and as opposing as we can possibly make it to say that we've done it. Mm. It's like, it's okay, we've done preventative training now, therefore microaggressions no longer exist in our institution. We'll be fine now. We'll be fine. Sexism isn't a thing anymore. Finished. You know, the patriarchy does not exist. We've done it. <laughs> well done. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, so I would kind of say sort of preventative training, brilliant, but kind of this is where you need to really go back to the bare bones basics and the trainers need to be well trained. The trainers yeah. need to be good. The trainers need to be as expansive and as well thought of as the wonderful academics that kind of sit within educational settings who are given all of this sort of research uh, leeway to do so. Um, we talk a lot. I've tam- I'm tangenting. No, you're not at all. This is really good. OK. We talk okay. a lot about academic freedom in higher education. And, and, I can, and, and it's all about, right, an academic really wants to do this, this um, potentially controversial piece of research. And it's academic freedom. It's academic freedom because the academic mind is something special, right? And, and, and their research is to be protected. And then there are huge swathes of higher education population who are students and professional service staff and little add-ons like us in student unions. Um, so uh, one, uh, 25% of the, of the university's population is protected ardently to critically think, to, to sort of evaluate things. And then the rest of us... <laughs> We're kind of said, uh, we're, we're kind of told, brilliant, but within, don't critically think, don't do it, but like, you know, um, but, but do these training sessions and fix every single problem. And we separate these wonderful academic staff from the rest of the university community, when in actual fact, if you, if you merged them all together, we could really learn from each other, mm. because we carry with us the practical application of that wonderful research whereas academics can stay in that wonderful research space. Of course they can. They don't have to then suddenly kind of say, right, okay, and now I can apply it to a business. Of course they don't have to. It's often the mode of delivery, and often the academics are so wonderful and so amazing at exactly what they're doing, their research, but it's how do you get that knowledge into the minds of Gen Zs who are (laughs) TikTok, 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 and... It's translating it almost, and exactly as you say, there's that expertise already existing yes. elsewhere in the universe. Yeah. In the universe already, um, what are you doing to collaborate in that way? So, De Montfort and DSU in particular, we have one of the best relationships between a student union and a university that I've come across, um, and. I don't know how it's happened, but I and it, but it's wonderful. It's this kind of genuine meeting of respectful minds, mm. and that means that the university values the student union space in holding the, in holding them to account on lots of different things, but including the systems that um, students kind of stumble over to try and get to where they want to go, okay. because higher education is just a system based on a system based on on a policy, <laughs> and, a, and it's just so overly complex. And that's when. You let academics run the show and you don't bring in a professional services mind. That is what happens. Sorry, acti- like, <laughs> argue with me. I'm sure you will. Um, so, and that's what kind of happens and that's sort of brilliant, whatever. That's how, you, how a university works. De Montfort works really well. 
So actually, when we run initiatives, so we have a wonderful advice service who have taken on kind of a more of a, an advice and projects, so an outreach based service. Um, student advice uh, traditionally is you make an appointment with an advisor, you talk about finances, you talk about rent, you talk about getting on with your housemates, you talk about mental health. Right, brilliant. And then you get uh, regulated, independent advice. And that's a, the, the beauty of a student union. Fantastic. Our advice service is taking on this kind of outreach role, which is we will also do collaborative projects. Mm. So we'll bring in university services, we'll come in all together and we'll run something. And it will be uh, a, a true kind of understanding that the student union exists as written in law to be the representative voice of students. That's who we are. The university exists to educate students and together we can kind of come up with something that actually works. So that's how we approach it. It's no quick fix, though, for no. systemic patriarchy. Uh, if only. <laughs> um, so many of the women uh, that we surveyed also reported generally being ignored or not consulted and having someone take credit for their work. It would be interesting to hear your take on how that affects women's experience going through education and, and beyond. It's so obviously we all know this happens. And, I, and I, I defy sitting in kind of a room with people who identify as men to say that that's wrong. Um, there is definitely a, a celebration of, I guess you would call these more masculine traits, of sort of sitting in a room and proudly sharing your opinion, whether it's wrong or not, whether it's because you can proudly argue. Um, and this kind of comes back to the sort of the questions we were chatting about before, about this sort of this at home, this kind of cultural normative, how, how boys are raised versus girls, kind of how, how we put boys in blue and blue is now an assertive colour uh, on the colour wheel and colour spectrum. Um, rather than a passive one, and how we put girls in pink, you know, and it's it kind of, it, it's sort of, and that's a very, very base level. It's very. a very, very base level. But it permeates things like this, and um, it permeates it because deep down, mm. women don't think that their opinion is valued, and that is why they don't share it. And women think that it's easier to just go, oh, yeah, that was your idea. And there is this sort of element as well, kind of in the classroom, in the boardroom, it doesn't really matter, of, um, and we call it mansplaining, we've, we've put language to it now, we call it where, where um, a man will kind of repeat your point, mm. and then everyone will go, oh yeah, and it's sort of this integrative misogyny where we hear a man's voice and it calms us because it has sort of more authority, and we hear a woman's voice and it calms us because it has more of that maternal sort of element and it kind of feels more like a hug. And that is, that is misogyny mm -hmm. because it's a bias based on gender identifying features, right? So, yeah, I think it's, it's not surprising that that happens. And when it comes to the classroom and it's kind of we spoke about sort of preventative training, there is preventative action that we should be taking um, just as we are trying to do for other microaggressions, um, you know, in regards to race, um, for example, that, that we can all do and we can kind of all help with. And then this is where ma male identifying individuals can actually really help female identifying individuals in those settings. And that is also where like the professors in those settings can also really help and sort of being aware of it and just like, oh, actually, Steve, I think Emily <laughs> was just speaking or actually John, I think um, Rachel was just uh, was actually just sort of said that point, and it kind of becomes this this brilliant kind of calling out of behaviours, but in a more natural Positive. way. Yeah, kind of a more not that was sexist. Yeah, leave the room. You know. Yeah, I'm cringing because I'm so familiar with these instant instances in yeah. in life, and I just always get taken back, and I think. But it, it happens now. Yeah. It happens now. It mm -hmm. happens in meetings that I sit in yeah. now. Um, and it's also really interesting, kind of this active listening piece. And again, I'm going into organisational psychology because that is where I feel kind of more confident yeah. to actually speak out. Because no matter my experience of being kind of marginalised because I'm a woman, it will never, ever come close to a woman of colour, mm. a woman with um, a disability. A, a trans woman. It'll never come close to how marginalised those people are. 
But, um, and this is why I'll always kind of bring it back to my area of expertise. But um, if you kind of look at it sort of at, at this sort of really like macro level, um, what we're doing when we allow these things to happen is we are actively um, pushing that group into a narrative that exists only to benefit one tiny part of it, which is a cishet mm. white male. And therefore, this expansive, wonderful experience of higher education, that those students won't experience that. And they might not, they might not immediately equate, oh, I've spoken over in that seminar today. Um, my, my educational experience isn't transformative, but it all adds up. It's also the, the, the very fact of just being able to identify it. Yeah. So I was spoken over because of who I am and that made it seem okay to that person because of who they are yeah and even realizing that is quite it's a realization where it's a penny drop moment when it happens but to get there is go that is a development of thought in, in itself yeah you're so you're so I love that phrasing as well a development of thought and um something that I think really helps people find their voice is understanding that development of thought and individualization. Um, and I think that's something that we always do. We do it as people. We clump people together to, so, so we can better understand mm. them. And we do that through the lens of our upbringing, our society, through a, through a multitude of different lenses. But, you know, uh, but that's what we do, right? Mm. I understand you. I know, I know who you are because I have put you into a category and, I, and now I feel more comfortable. Kind of my brain has calmed down a little bit. Mm. Okay. And, that, and we, we go into bias, unconscious bias, and that's where that comes from. Sort of the calming of the brain because I can tell you who you are. Mm. For anyone uh, listening that may still be thinking or wondering, a microaggressions just wokery, are you able to explain a little bit into how they can lead to much more overt behaviours like sexism, misogyny, and ultimately hate towards women? Yes. Um, if anybody... W wokery is such a divisive term, yeah. isn't it? Um, so I think I'll, I'll move us away from anything divisive, sure. which is that it's okay to learn. It's okay to be wrong. And I think that that would be kind of the main message um, that it's all right to research and it's okay to think, oh, potentially the way that I'm thinking and feeling right now comes from the, uh, a more of a groupthink mentality where um, it's more confirmation bias because all the people I keep around me all say the same thing. And maybe it's okay to want to know more. Um, and terms like microaggression put language to um, true human experiences. And I, be I truly believe that human beings really care about each other. That's why we, we kind of, that's why effect heuristic happens. Mm. That, that's why people kind of get into these camps because they're sort of, they're, they're feeling things. They're kind of mad at being told that microaggression is, is uh, that, that, they're, that they're aggressive in any way. They're, they're mad about this kind of wokery um, because they're feeling judged. Um, but I guess my response to that would be, Radical acceptance of self. We do not know it all. People are having a genuine human experience and microaggressions are part of that. And they do lead to wider sort of discriminatory behaviors because all they are is they're just, if, if, um, if misogyny is a plant, then uh, microaggressions are like the roots or the mm. seeds. They, they all lead to the same thing. And somebody is having a genuine experience that's hurting them. And if we kind of look at people as human beings and sort of go through their lens of, of understanding that experience and this idea of wokery, I'm, I'm going around in circles now, this idea of wokery kind of really dehumanizes people. It minimizes a genuine emotion. It minimizes how people are feeling. Um, all I would say is do some research, start looking up microaggressions and it might make you feel uncomfortable if you can see yourself doing them but it also dramatically expands you as a human being and radical exception acceptance of self mm -hmm. do your personality type google oh. it <laughs> i'll try <laughs> sarah thank you so much as always it's been a total pleasure and uh 
a development of thought chatting to you. So I really, really appreciate your time um, today. Thank you for having me. Always a pleasure. Yay. Thank you.